Welcome to Haunted London, a shadowy world of torment and fear, where dark shadows lurk around every corner, where lonely, dispossessed souls seek revenge for evil done to them in the past, and where evil monsters refuse to rest, a world from which no one is safe. I've been frightened before. I'm an ex-policeman. For a while I looked after a riot squad, and that was quite scary. But this was abject, bone-shaking terror. Be prepared to be afraid, very afraid, as we uncover the most gruesome goings-on from the ghostly world of murderers and their victims. Welcome to Haunted London. <laughs> Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. London's West End, a world-famous theater land at the very heart of the capital. A place of glitz and glamour and millions of dollars a year in takings. Visitors flock here to see the big names up in lights. But not all the dramas played out here are advertised on the billboards. London's theater land is also the backdrop for tales of tragedy and terror. There are malevolent shadows lurking in the wings here. Shadows which the theaters would rather you didn't know about. And nowhere is this more evident than in one of the West End's oldest and most famous playhouses, the Theatre Royal in Drury Lane. It's one of London's most popular venues, with the living and with the dead. There have been so many first-hand encounters with the theatre's company of thuggish ghosts that even hardened skeptics have been forced to acknowledge their existence. Well, I thought I was going mad. You know, I never believed in ghosts at all, and I really had to change my mind. I mean, we were definitely physically attacked, in fact. So it was really very strange indeed, and one must put it to some supernatural cause. I, I frankly was very skeptical about ghosts. I mean, I worked in theaters, heard stories, but never seen anything or experienced anything. Uh, that wasn't until I came to Drury Lane. Lift your gaze from the stage if you come to a performance here. You might spot one theatergoer who didn't pay for his ticket. 200 years ago, Joe Grimaldi was the talk of the town. His fame came from pantomime, for which he invented a new type of character, the innocent rogue, which has become the model for clowns ever since. To this day, clowns the world over are called Joeys in his honor. But behind the mask, Grimaldi was a sick and desperate man. Theater was his life, but it cost him his health as he grew increasingly crippled by his acrobatic exploits. William Bryars is an expert on the history of the theater and its performers, particularly Joe Grimaldi. Joey started very young. His first appearance was at two and a half. So he'd spent all his life um, tumbling, falling about. Um, and I think and and all the running back and forwards the, between the other theatres, it all took its toll. In 1807, Grimaldi played his farewell performance at the Theatre Royal. Unable to remain standing for long, he was helped to a chair close to the footlights where he took his final curtain call. But the world hadn't seen the last of Joe Grimaldi. It is said he made a bizarre request that when he died, his head should be severed from his body. Since then, it has been seen floating about, and that's not all he does. Here at the Theatre Royal Jury Lay, Joey is recognized and known for giving people a kick. And it's, um, it can be anybody. It can be the actors, it can be stage crew, it can be cleaners, anybody who works in the theatre. Robert Stanton knows all too well what the ghosts of Drury Lane do for kicks. As stage manager here in the 1950s and 60s, he and his friends had the bruises to prove it. Well, I was queuing the show one night, and suddenly the floorboards started to creak, which I thought was very strange. And then somebody th thrust their hand into my trouser pocket, uh, and I went to get hold of it, but there was nothing there at all, and I looked round, and there was no one in sight. And then my deputy came round, and I told him what had happened, 
And he said, well, somebody's just hit me hard on the shoulder. We really couldn't understand it at all. And then Betty Wolfe, who's playing the housekeeper, she said, oh, well, thank goodness something happened to you because somebody has just pinched my behind hard. It seems that Joe Grimaldi is not the only theater royal favorite who has found it hard to give up the limelight after death. Dan Lino was a world champion clog dancer turned music hall star who first trod the boards at the age of four. He became a household name, acclaimed as the king of pantomime dames. At the height of his fame, Dan Lino went mad. He died in 1904 at the age of 43, apparently before he was ready to take the final curtain. For nearly a century now, he has continued to return to the Theater Royal for encores. When Nick Bromley was the company manager of the theater's production of The Pirates of Penzance in 1981, he found himself involved in a different sort of drama in the wings. I was standing just watching the show and suddenly I got this push on my shoulder and I spun literally like that round. Well, looked around, there was nobody here. So I thought, well, that's ridiculous, it can't have happened. I told people and they said, oh, come on, you know, you're, you're making it up, you're a bit, you know what. Um, so I said, no, I definitely experienced this. The next night, because it was an entrance, one of the actresses was standing directly where I am standing now and she had poo-pooed my story, as it were, but she felt a hand pulling her wig from behind. I think it happened because the company office used to be a quick change room where Dan Lino would change his frocks, and I think we were literally standing in his way. I mean, he pushed me because I was a man, but he wouldn't have pushed a lady. He was a gentleman, so he just tugged her hair. Perhaps this same gentlemanly sensitivity explains the most famous trait of Dan Lino's ghost. Lino suffered badly from incontinence, which he disguised with perfume. As a consequence, his ghost is often detected by scent. That, that's what people are most aware of with Dan in this theater, is the smell. You suddenly get a whiff of lavender. He goes past. Have you smelled it? A little bit once. The Theatre Royal isn't just one of London's most haunted theatres, it's also one of the oldest theatre sites. Actors and audiences have been coming here since 1663. The buildings burned down so many times that eventually they invented the fire safety curtain here, and it's in the area behind that curtain, backstage, that a violent event led to another haunting. In 1735, two actors began a furious argument over a wig. One, Charles Maplin, lifted a stick to beat the other, Woodruff, and put his eye out, an injury which was to prove fatal. During this tussle over the wig, Maplin stabbed Woodruff in the eye. And when Woodruff was lying on the floor there, Macklin, to try and be helpful, then proceeded to urinate in his eye, whether that was to disinfect it or not, but he was certainly thought he was being helpful. It didn't work. Woodruff died. But it is thought the gesture did help Macklin win an acquittal at the subsequent trial. Today, though, it seems Macklin's spirit can't leave the scene of his outburst. The ghost of Macklin is believed to be the ghost that haunts the front of the stalls here. It is a very active ghost, walks up and down, paces about. Macklin was a very physical actor. He was always on the go. He was a man with huge energy, and therefore it's generally assumed that this ghost is, because it is such a, a active ghost, that that one is Macklin. It was while the current theater was being built on the ruins of the old in the 1870s that workmen opened up a void behind the wall and made a find which has since been connected to the theater's most famous ghost. Those who work at Drury Lane have been puzzling over the facts behind the discovery ever since. Workmen knocked through a wall and discovered in this area a skeleton with a Cromwellian dagger and some people say some pieces of grey fabric in the ribs. Now interestingly enough, before that time people had reported seeing a ghost, a man dressed in grey. The man in grey, the theatre's most frequently seen ghost, is slim, young and dressed in a white rough shirt. 
gray riding cloak, and three-cornered hat of the 18th century. He wears riding boots and carries a sword. Now this is the upper circle entrance that they created, which is where all of the sightings of the man in grey have been made, as he walks along the back of the auditorium towards the side wall in the direction of the skeleton void area. Now we have no idea of how the skeleton is connected to the ghost. Was the ghost the killer or the victim? There's no way of knowing. All we know is that he passes from the auditorium and disappears through the wall where the skeleton was found. Now, as well as being seen walking across the back of the auditorium, the man in grey has been sighted sitting in this very seat watching rehearsals. And there is a story of one cleaner, quite new to the building, who reported a man in the exact same clothes as everyone else describes for the man in grey sitting in this seat. Curiously, for a ghost with such terrible associations, the grey man's appearances are viewed as positive events. He appears in daylight often during rehearsals, and only if the forthcoming run is going to be a success. And he can hardly be accused of shyness. In 1939, he appeared in front of half the cast of The Dancing Years. The Grey Man is really the biggest mystery, because we haven't got a clue as to who he is. When he appears in a riding cloak, he's got a tricorn hat on. Whether he's a member of the audience, whether he's um, a patron, whether he's been a follower of one of the actresses. We really do not know. He is a mystery to us as to who he is, although he's the one that's seen most regularly. The dramas played out off stage in London's theatre land have been as violent and mysterious as any of the nightly performances. Next time you buy a ticket, you might get more excitement than you planned. Right at the heart of Mayfair, one of London's most exclusive neighborhoods, is Barclay Square. The elegant homes have always been highly sought after by London's high society. All that is apart from this house. For years, number 50 stood empty. It's been nearly a century now since anyone lived in the house after a catalog of suicides, bizarre deaths, and people being driven insane by apparitions. Nobody dared. To this day, people who are sensitive to psychic phenomena say that the very brickwork is charged with a strange energy. But according to Richard Jones, author of Walking Haunted London, the very horrors which gave this house its fearful reputation also made it a dangerous magnet for the curious and foolhardy. A hundred or so years ago, the building had become something of a tourist attraction. In fact, Charles Harper, in 1907, writes in his book Haunted Houses that the famous haunted house in Barclay Square was long one of those things that no country cousin come up from the province to London on sightseeing bent ever willingly missed. Unearthly phenomena were witnessed from the street. Onlookers described seeing flashing lights. They heard screams and the sound of a heavy body being dragged down the stairs. But it's what went on inside 50 Barclay Square which earned this house its terrible reputation and claimed lives. These days, the interior of the house belies its grisly past. It's hard to imagine a place more sedate and decorous. For the last 60 years, it's been an antiquarian bookshop. But there can be few stories on the shelves more bizarre than the tales surrounding these very rooms. There are several ghosts here, all of which are quite enigmatic. We have tales of girls who've committed suicide in an attempt to thwart the lustful approaches of the master of the house and flung themselves from the windows, and their spirits now look forlornly from the upper windows of the building onto Barclay Square. Fatal falls are woven into the history of the house and its hauntings. The earliest ghost is said to be that of the five-year-old daughter of a servant who lived on the top floor. The girl plunged to her death down steep stairs. But the nature of the main ghost in the house is unclear, since no one seeing it has survived or remained sane long enough to describe what they saw. Some years after the death of the little girl, another maid was shown to her new room at the top of the house. Good night. 
Two hours later, the household was awoken by shrieks of horror. When the family raced to the assistance of their maid, they found her standing in the middle of the room as rigid as a corpse, with her eyes wide open and staring. She was never able to tell them what she had seen, because she never regained her sanity. Soon after that terrible incident, a group of young men were spending a night in the house, drinking and gambling. For a wager, one of them said he would spend the night in the maid's haunted bedroom. If anything happened to him, he told his friends, he would ring the servant's bell twice. When his friends raced upstairs, they found him dead. His face was contorted with horror, and his open eyes were bulging from their sockets. This must be one of the most unusual and unique haunted locations in London, not just for the nature of the enigmatic ghost, but also for the people's reaction to that ghost, uh, very violent reactions in some cases. Today, number 50 Barclay Square is owned by John Maggs, an antiquarian book dealer. So far, he has been spared the horrors that have befallen some of the previous occupants. But he can still sense an alarming presence in the house. People have seen things, even recently. The story about somebody having his glasses snatched off his, out of his hand on the stairs. That was only in the last year or so. So I'm forced to believe there may be something here. And then only, what, a few weeks ago, we had a picture fall down the stairs, which could have been a poltergeist, possible. And then there's the famous episode with our cleaner. We were clearing out for a party in this room, and she was convinced somebody was behind her. And we turned around, there wasn't anybody there. So it may be that this, whoever it is, liked or didn't like, what was going on in the house, their house. One recent event involved Julian Wilson, who also works here as a book dealer. He was working alone in the building one weekend when he was startled by a mysterious apparition. Not a human figure, but a strange brown mist. This is the room up here, which actually it was where I actually had the sighting of this brown mist. And I was actually standing, or in fact sitting over here at this desk, actually working away on the computer screen. And then here I am typing away, looking at the screen, and I suddenly look up and there's a brown mist moving from right to left very, very quickly and in a second gone. But this is also the room, incidentally, where the maid was and where the uh, chap who died of fright is meant to have been. And this is the sort of centre, the the room, where all the sightings at number 50 have emanated from. It was after the death of the young man that the house fell empty and grew neglected, a telling indication of its notoriety, given that this is some of London's most valuable real estate. And it was while it was standing vacant that the next chapter in its terrible history unfolded. One night, two sailors who'd been out on the town broke into the house. They were looking for a place to bed down for the night. Who knows what drew them to the exact room where all the previous horror had occurred. In the middle of the night, they were woken by the sound of heavy, determined footsteps coming up the stairs.
a hideous, shapeless mass began forcing its way into the room. One of the sailors made it to the door and escaped, but his friend was left cornered beside the open window. In his terror, he jumped to his death. When his friend returned with the police officer, they discovered the body impaled on railings. His twisted face and bulging eyes were testimony to the horror of his final moments. After the gruesome events of that night, the house and its ghosts lay dormant for over 20 years. The family of John Maggs eventually took over the property, but he treats the mysterious occupants of the house with cautious respect. I'm quite prepared to believe there is something then, because when you've been an antiquarian all your life, and I can sit down with a book, and I can get right into that book, and the spirit of the person who wrote it, <clears throat> in my case it's Captain Cook, Bly, and so on, I know them all, I feel, intimately. And that's a little bit like this same mystic problem. Spirits confined to the pages of books are one thing, but the stories surrounding number 50 Barclay Square are only too real and menacing, according to the experts. This place is remarkable because it's the only haunted location I can think of in London where you have a ghost that is intent on evil and that is actually out to damage or harm people. But also it's the one building I can think of where you have such a collection of ghosts and sightings in such a small location. London's Langham Hotel opened in 1865 and has been visited by several greats, including Mark Twain, Oscar Wilde and Arthur Conan Doyle. It has also reportedly been frequented by a number of ghosts, the most common of which is a sighting of a man in Victorian evening wear in room 333 who apparently appears only during the month of October. Another guest claimed to have seen the figure of a man in military attire standing by the window on the fourth floor, which is said to be the ghost of a German prince who jumped out of a window before the start of the First World War. It is also believed that Napoleon III, another former guest, haunts the basement of the hotel. The hotel is said to be one of the most ghostly places in the world, and for that reason has to be one of the most haunted hotels you don't want to visit. Heart of London, amidst some of the city's most comfortable and genteel streets, Hampstead Heath is a square mile of wilderness, which has changed little for centuries, where some who held a reign of terror in life continue to strike fear after death. The village beside Hampstead Heath has long been the haunt of some of London's wealthiest citizens, frequented by literary greats like Dickens and Byron. But as the area became fashionable and affluent in the 1700s, the lowlife who robbed and murdered the rich were attracted too. The undercurrent of crime and death has continued into modern times. Ruth Ellis, the last woman to be hanged in Britain, killed her lover here, and the pub where it happened still bears the scars of her bullets. On the heath, there are suicides in the ponds. In the 70s, a man crucified himself to death. The picturesque villages surrounding the heath are haunted by this past. There are streets lined with houses, squares all with their own ghostly tales, and particularly, you find haunted pubs, the most famous of which is the Gatehouse. The Gatehouse is probably the oldest pub in Highgate and could date back as far as the 1300s. A century ago, frequented by novelists and poets, it was renowned for its shilling ordinaries, vast lunches. Today it's known for more sinister reasons. The upper story, once a courtroom, was recently converted into a theater. The theater owners soon discovered the drama wouldn't be confined to the stage. Well, when we moved in, we'd heard about the ghost, and our very first experience of it was when we cleared the room entirely down there of all the junk that was there, and one thing was left, and that was this table. And we left it down there in the middle of the room. And we came back one morning, and suddenly it was under the window. And we thought, oh, maybe we didn't leave it there. It happened a couple of days later. The table had moved the next day when we came back. And we thought, well, maybe somebody's playing a prank on us, but the pub manager swore blind that he, that he hadn't moved the table. So we thought, right, three of us sat round, we put the table under the window, 
and we knew it was there. We weren't imagining it. We came in the next morning and the table had moved again. And this is a big table. I mean, it's sort of six, eight foot long here and it was sat right in the middle of the room. There were more strange happenings in the pub below. Sounds of bottling up from the cellar when there was no one there and a landlord who resigned after what he felt was a supernatural attack. From way, way back in the 60s, there was a manager here. And the story was at the time that this manager came up here to turn the lights on for a function that was happening and was attacked by something. Um, now, this happened apparently two or three times, and eventually this manager uh, had to go to the Whittington Hospital down the road uh, and sort of went in and told them that he'd suffered by being attacked by a ghost, and of course they didn't believe him. Anyway, this happened two or three times, and eventually he asked the, uh, the brewery for a transfer to another pub. I know that one day I'm going to see it. I just got a feeling. But those who study ghosts know it's on the heath itself that the sense of strangeness is at its strongest. Well, Hampstead Heath, even today, can be dark, it can be shadowy, and it's very easy to mistake maybe uh, someone moving amongst the trees or maybe even a shadow cast from the trees for something far more sinister. You can expect the unexpected on the heath. Dave Brooks has played bagpipes on the Heath several times a week since he heard them being played in a vision here. Still for him, it's a place of mystery. I had a vision that I was going to play the pipes when I was walking one day up by Bodice's burial mound, which is over the top, over that way. It's a very magical place, mainly because this water rises up in about sort of eight to ten different places formed ponds. The ponds were built as reservoirs in the 18th century. And people go there, people have been going there for years. People can actually go and spend all day up there. And um, anywhere where there's water coming up is a magical place. But also the fact that it's um, green and it's in London, in the middle of London. It's so lush and green and that's why it's magical. And it's mysterious as well because it's open. It's always open, it's never closed, and it's right in the middle of a city. David Roper has been swimming in the men's pond on the Heath every day since 1946. On his first day as a lifeguard here, he had to drag the body of a suicide victim from the water. There was a suicide case, and I had to deal with it. I can still remember the guy. Someone from the bank called and said, Oi, mate, you got a geezer in here. That was the exact words. And I pulled him onto the bank. There was nothing I'd do. He just literally walked into the pond with all his clothes on and just went under, you know, committed suicide. And uh, he was a tall chap, a uh, very heavy coat. That I do remember. Many choose to die here in that way. Have they left their mark on this place? There are wavelengths from past times which are present even to this day. You can feel totally insecure if you go into the shades, the darkness, and you feel like someone's coming up behind you or something like that. It's rather unnerving, so it is. It does happen. And because many things have had taken place over on these films. Stephen Rowlandson, too, swims here every day. Once come across the heath late at night, you know, in the middle of the night, and it's been absolutely dark, completely quiet. And, you know, to say that you're in a place near the centre of London, it's, it's, it seems like a very empty, lonely place. It's easy to think why people uh, imagine a place like Hampstead Heath is haunted, because there's, there's been such a history of highwaymen, and people were hanged here. And so I think the spirits of these people, they're probably still here somewhere around us. I came here for a late swim at night, and uh, after my swim, I came out on the side and I was drying myself, and there was footsteps along here. And <laughs> to this day, I'm not able to account for them. So was it someone from the past? Someone who used to be a pond regular? I don't know. But they actually did ha it actually did happen. They came along here, and I was on my own. And I'm not able to account for what they were doing here. And there was no one here other than myself.
but perhaps the most fearsome ghosts date from a time when the heath was at its most troubled. From the 17th to the 19th century, this bleak scrubland provided cover for some of London's most ruthless thieves and killers, the highwaymen. By 1699, there were so many that troopers were ordered to scour the roads every night. Hampstead Heath was a wild and desolate place. It was a dangerous place. Indeed, only the very foolish or the very brave would even venture into its hinterland. But as such, it was the perfect place for highwaymen to hide out amongst the trees and gallop out and rob their unsuspecting prey, on many occasions, perhaps even murder them. This was the first stop for travelers on their way out of London and the last stop for those coming in. To journey this road was to run the gauntlet. Highwaymen would lurk around the inns and toll house for intelligence about those who would be passing through. Most famous of all, Dick Turpin, a man who in reality was nothing like the legend which built up around him. The legendary Dick Turpin, of course, was a 19th century creation from the writer Harrison Ainsworth. The factual Dick Turpin was a complete psychopath, a very ugly person, the sort of person who would turn on anybody and was wont to torture people, you know, shoot people dead, all in order to get his own way. By 1739, in his mid-thirties, it was all over for Turpin. He was hanged for horse-stealing. But has he since returned to his former stomping grounds? Well, the most bizarre sighting in recent years must have been the sighting that happened to Helen Stiple. She was out jogging on the heath uh, one evening when she turned round and saw a horseman galloping towards her. Now, she was convinced that the horseman was going to run her down and began to run, but still the horseman kept coming, so she flung herself to the ground. And when she looked up again, the horseman had completely disappeared. By the 19th century, with better policing and street lighting, the game was up for the cutthroat rapist robbers who liked to call themselves gentlemen of the road. The terror of their deeds faded and they became folk heroes. But on Hampstead Heath, do they return to remind us they can still strike fear into those they choose as their victims? The Tower of London, England. This historic fortress is not only a former royal palace, but also one of the most haunted locations in the country. Its bloody, tumultuous history has left a mark on the tower and gave rise to centuries of ghost stories and paranormal sightings. Among the most famous ghosts is Anne Boleyn. Anne, second wife of Henry VIII, was executed on the Tower Green in 1536. She's often reported to be seen wandering the grounds, sometimes near the site of her execution, or in the chapel royal of St. Peter at Vincula, where she's buried. The most chilling sighting is her carrying her severed head under her arm, a spectral image that has captured the public's imagination for centuries. Another well-known ghost is Henry VI. This monarch was murdered in the Wakefield Tower in 1471 during the Wars of the Roses. His spirit appears as the clock strikes midnight to solemnly pace the tower where he met his untimely end. The ghost of Lady Jane Grey, the Nine Days Queen, is also reported to haunt the tower. Executed at the age of 16 in 1554, her pale and sorrowful apparition wanders the battlements. She remains a tragic figure of innocence caught in the deadly political machinations of her time. Edward Feuve and his younger brother Richard, Duke of York, also called the Tower Princes, are two of the tower's most poignant resident ghosts. After their mysterious disappearance in 1483, their spirits began to haunt the bloody tower where they were held before their disappearance. Visitors and staff have reported the sounds of children's laughter and footsteps, adding to the mystery surrounding their fate. Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, also haunts the tower. She was executed in a particularly gruesome manner in 1541. The usual executioner at the tower was absent at the time sent north to battle the rebellion. An inexperienced and clumsy youth was next in line. It took 11 strokes to decapitate Lady Pole. 
The first completely missed her neck and landed on her shoulder. She had no idea what charges were against her until the time of her execution, and she emphatically denied her guilt until the end. Now, her spirit reenacts her desperate attempt to flee from her executioner. A ghostly bear is one of the most unusual apparitions. It was reported near the Martin Tower in the 1800s. According to legend, the phantom bear caused such terror that the guard who saw it died of a heart attack just after. This spectral bear is believed to be connected to the tower's history as a menagerie, which housed exotic animals brought to England as royal gifts. Other paranormal incidents reported include phantom procession of ghostly figures dressed in ancient armor crossing the tower grounds. The eerie sound of drum beats is sometimes heard, believed to be the spectral presence of a drummer boy who was beheaded during the English Civil War. The Tower of London's rich history and its role in the lives and deaths of so many significant figures have created an enduring legacy of ghost stories and paranormal activity. Visitors and staff alike continue to share tales of unexplained phenomena, making the tower not only a significant historical site, but also a focal point for those interested in the supernatural. For the pinnacle of London's Ghost Society, take a trip down the River Thames to Hampton Court, the one-time home of the infamous King Henry VIII, who got through six wives in his 36-year reign. Many of their spirits still roam here. Hampton Court was built in opulent style in 1514 by Cardinal Wolsey. He lived there so lavishly, his hospitality became the talk of Europe. But the master Wolsey served, the same King Henry VIII, was a violent and unreasonable man, a king desperate for an heir, who was determined that nothing and no one would stand in his way. When Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon, wife number one, failed to produce an heir, he demanded Wolsey secure him an annulment. Wolsey couldn't, and as he fell from grace, Henry forced him to surrender the palace, then charged him with treason anyway. But the embittered Wolsey still returns to his beloved Hampton Court, dressed in his religious robes, just one of many ghosts who owe their sad presence to the murderous King Henry. Roy Porter is an expert on the history and intrigues of the court. Henry was an extremely ruthless king. He was determined to have a male heir to the throne, and when his first wife failed to deliver that child, after 24 years of marriage, that marriage came to an end abruptly, with Henry breaking away from the Church of Rome to have that marriage annulled. He then married a further five times. Two of those wives were executed. That was Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. Uh, also, various members of the nobility found their way to the block during Henry's reign. They got in his way. Uh, the driving force behind Henry's career was his determination to find a male heir and to succeed him. The turbulence of those times has sent ripples into the lives of today's inhabitants of the palace. The current director, Dennis McGuinness, believes he lives alongside the ghost of one of Henry's wives or a member of their household. This was Castle of Aragon's presence chamber. She was the first queen of, of Henry VIII the way back in the 16th century. And this is where she met her official guests. And this is from where I saw an apparition commonly described as a ghost. Just in this doorway just here, a slight female diminutive figure raised in heavy blue material. And I followed it, so real, into the hallway here. I had said to her, to the shape, something like, stop, come back, speak to me. Having said it, I realized I must look very, very stupid. Nobody can be sure who the figure was, though Dennis McGuinness has seen her nine times. The public have not. This part of the palace is off limits to visitors, but other ghosts do appear in public areas. One of the best known is that of Jane Seymour, Henry's third wife. The young queen seemed to have answered all Henry's prayers when she gave birth to a son. The child was passed into the care of a nurse, Sybil Penn, because his mother had suffered complications during the birth. The queen never recovered. She developed a fever, and 12 days later, she was dead. Ever since then, on the day the young prince was born, a figure in white, her head bent in sadness, has been seen wandering through the palace. This is the silver six staircase I'm standing in front of, and this is a, a modern version of the original Tudor staircase which would have run up to Jane Seymour's apartments. And it's been alleged that a spectral figure in white carrying a lit taper has been seen on the staircase behind me. 
And indeed, it has been alleged that some members of staff who have seen this figure have been so frightened by its appearance that they've resigned shortly afterwards. The young Prince Edward remained in the care of Nurse Penn until his death at the age of 15. Sybil Penn herself later died of smallpox and was buried across the river. But Nurse Penn's eternal rest was cut short after 300 years. When the 19th century story started to appear of this lady in grey haunting the palace, and it was thought that this lady was Sybil Penn. These stories started after the church when she was buried. Hampton Church was struck by lightning. The church was rebuilt, her grave was disturbed, and it was after her bones were disturbed that her spectre came back to haunt the palace. The old nurse doesn't seem to be such a caring figure now. In one manifestation, her ghost was seen with the daughter of Princess Frederica of Hanover. Shortly afterwards, the child died. Henry married his fifth wife, the pretty and vivacious Catherine Howard, when she was still in her teens. He called her his rose without a thorn. He was besotted with her, but she was still in love with a much younger man, her childhood sweetheart, Tom Culpepper. As the affair intensified, the couple began to take risks. Culpepper would sneak into the palace for secret assignations. Their attempts to keep their affair secret failed. Servants became aware of what was going on and began to gossip. Eventually, the story of the affair got back to King Henry. Catherine was questioned and tried in the great watching chamber at the palace, where the fact of her adultery was made public. Culpepper was taken straight to the Tower of London, where he was executed, and his severed head was displayed on Tower Bridge. Catherine was imprisoned in her chambers as she awaited her own certain death. It's said she escaped from her room and fled down the corridor leading to the Royal Chapel, where Henry was at prayer. She pounded at the door, but the king stayed silent and guards dragged her back to her prison. Shortly afterwards, Catherine too was sent to the Tower of London to be beheaded. But as she laid her beautiful young head on the block, she seemed to have found peace. She said to have smiled and to have uttered the words, I die a queen, but I would rather die the simple wife of Tom Culpepper. <laughs> but perhaps the smile was deceptive. For here at Hampton Court, her ghost has been seen running again and again down the corridor to the chapel door. So famous have the sightings of Catherine become that the corridor has now been named the Haunted Gallery. But some believe the story has its origins in a very unsupernatural dispute over accommodation at the palace. Well, the stories associated with Catherine Howard and the Haunted Gallery didn't start until the 19th century, until the 1870s, when two residents of grace and favor who were living in that part of the palace were campaigning to be moved to another part of Hampton Court. And coincidentally, uh, they noticed that their part of the palace was haunted by a figure, a shrieking figure running along the gallery towards the Chapel Royal. But the palace director, Dennis McGuinness, is far from sure the stories can be dismissed. Here we are at Chapel Cloister just outside the Chapel Royal, and just beneath the famous and infamous Haunted Gallery, where reputedly Catherine Howard's ghost is seen at various times. I had experienced some time ago, just in this spot, about 10.30 in the evening, when I came past here, I was filled with a sense of inordinate terror, absolute bone-shaking terror. Nothing to explain it, nothing to be seen, nothing to be felt, apart from this horrendous terror. I made no sense of it. Um, sometime later, I was interviewed by a parapsychologist who, amongst other questions, asked me if anyone had ever gone to the deaths from the Chapel Royal. And of course, Catherine Howard had pleaded for her life and been banished. And this lady said, well, yes, I reckon you walked into the entity of Catherine Howard. Recently, the royal family permitted Dr. Richard Wiseman, an expert in ghostly phenomena, to explore a scientific basis for the sightings. We asked people to walk through the haunted gallery to mark on a floor plan where they experienced something unusual, such as a sudden drop in temperature or feeling sick. What we found was about half of the people had an unusual experience, about a fifth of those thought they were due to ghosts. 
We set up equipment in the areas that they identified for us, and we found out that, yes, indeed, there were odd environmental factors there. There were sudden drops in temperature, and there were some areas here that have extremely unusual thermal patterns. But the ghosts of King Henry VIII's wives don't just populate Hampton Court. One of them has been sighted at London's most famous and infamous fortress, the Tower of London, whose bloody history of torture and execution has left a rich legacy of tormented ghosts and horrible hauntings. The Tower of London is up next. The Tower of London, steeped in blood, history, and ghosts. For centuries, the great, the good, and the traitorous were sent here to be executed if they incurred the wrath of the King or Queen of England. As the visitors who flock to the tower during the day take their leave, this place is left to its memories and its ghosts. Today, the many individual towers and buildings known collectively as the Tower of London and their supernatural inhabitants are watched over by yeoman warders or beef eaters. The most frequently seen ghost is that of the ill-fated Queen Anne Boleyn, wife number two of King Henry VIII. She was a lady-in-waiting at court when she caught the eye of the lascivious Henry. They were married, but Anne failed to provide the king with a son, a male heir. And she had many enemies at court. They spread rumors about her affairs, witchcraft, and traitorous behavior. She was arrested and taken to the tower. As she awaited execution, she sent a message to Henry begging her head to be cut off with a sword rather than an axe, because an axe often took more than one stroke to sever a head. She was granted her wish. On May 18, 1536, she was executed by sword on Tower Green. <laughs> It said that when the executioner lifted her head to show the assembled crowd, her eyes were still surveying the scene and her lips were still in the motion of prayer. Quite quickly, her ladies in waiting placed her remains in an arrow box, took the head underneath the arm, and the remains were taken and buried in our little chapel of St. Peter of Vincula. Many times, sightings have been seen of Anne Boleyn walking around Tower Green. In 1864, a guardsman was on duty at the tower. He was patrolling an area close to the Queen's house, where Anne Boleyn was said to have spent her last night before being executed. Suddenly, he saw the figure of a woman emerge from the morning mist. He challenged her to halt, but the figure ignored his commands. As she got closer, he saw to his horror that the figure had no face. An officer found the guardsman slumped on the ground. The man was court-martialed for being drunk on duty but the soldier claimed he had in fact collapsed in fright. The judge didn't believe him, but then other soldiers stepped forward to say they too had seen the lady below the room where Anne Boleyn spent the last night of her life. The soldier was cleared. The Queen's house may have other spirits besides Anne Boleyn's. One evening, Catherine Campbell, personal secretary to the governor of the tower, was working here. I was coming up the main staircase of Queen's House, which is here, and I was on the second floor. I was going up to write invitations for a VIP reception, and halfway up the stairs, on an overhanging white wall, I suddenly saw the image of a lady with a white, white ruffle collar and reddish hair. It looked to me a little bit like a portrait, because it was from the waist up. I blinked and it had gone, it was very quick. Then I went on up into the room where I was heading for, and I got a very odd shiver up my spine. And to me, it seems as if I think I've seen a ghost. London is a city where the past has never quite accepted it must give way to the present. The spirits who suffered then, suffer now. If you visit this most haunted city on earth, don't let them draw you into their world.
Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.